All right. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Matt. Good morning, everybody. Um, so much has happened since we were last together a few months ago uh, that we don't really even know where to start. But several of you have reached out to us over the last uh, couple of weeks expressing an interest in um, having some time together today, although our time is short. But while we were together today, um, we wanted to give you all an opportunity to, to sort of speak from the heart and from the mind and uh, talk amongst one another and to each other about what's going on in the country, uh, not just with COVID-19 and the illness, illnesses um, threatening us, but with the social unrest that is currently underway. So um, we do have a short time together today, but we do want to allow the first half hour of our meeting this morning uh, and just open the floor to you all. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, do just that. I'm gonna open the floor and let you all um, have a free conversation and uh, feel free to jump in for discussion at any time. And I'm gonna stop right there. I'd like to ask Eric a question, which is how does everything that's going on, how do, what do you think the effect on the film business is or should be? Um, I think, you know, this is uh, a complex issue. Um, and I think true solutions, there is no one and there's nothing easy, but um, I think each of us in our personal, you know, family life and our neighborhood, in our church or other religious organization gathering, you know, wherever we can begin to build connections. I think the ultimate solution Obviously, there's some other things, some justice and things like that that need to happen. But when people are connected at the heart level and or able to be in a position to have conversations, sometimes difficult ones, but I'm looking at you over a cup of coffee and I'm not going to walk out on you because of that. But we have a, a, a connection uh, where we can build those. I think that's where, you know, we can begin to make some progress. So uh, how does that affect us again in our personal life? How do we do that in our places of work? If we're, you know, full time in the film business, uh, what does that look like? You know, how diverse are our um, our companies, our teams that we put together um, in terms of the content that's produced? Is there an opportunity within the content to, uh, you know, uh, raise awareness? Um, you know, build connections, bring up some themes. So I think. Uh, it's a multi-part solution, but, um, and I think each of us, we won't come up with the answers here, but something to reflect on. What can I do, um, you know, to make improvements in, in this area? So I don't know if that answered the question, but just some thoughts I've been having. Thank you, Eric, um, for bringing up um, the idea and the notion that we would have some time to talk about this because um, it's the world that I live in. Everything, the reason why I'm here is because I've been invited because uh, people know me to work on this continually, but the experience of working on this is a very lonely one until now. And so it is an opportunity for us to get together. And I just want to say that as we're moving through the next um, weeks and months in this conversation, I don't think it's going to go away in ways that it's gone away in the past. Um, I just want to say, at, at least the ground that I stand on is that everybody on this call is dedicated to um, doing the right thing. So just know that uh, whatever I do within this forum, that's my assumption. Um, however, um, this is a when we talk about content, 
Um, that is a really, really big area. And in every one of the calls that I've been in thus far, I've always brought up the fact that BIPOC, the BIPOC community, um, Black, Indigenous, um, people of color, um, are left out of most of the areas that we're talking about. I think I really want to, and I feel a responsibility to really um, state that very, very strongly. So all of those numbers that we report at the beginning of each meeting that we have, there, there, are, there are significant populations in this state that are left out of those numbers. And the impact on people like me and Eric uh, is that we are trying to hold up a community to believe that it is possible to be able to tell your own stories. Because right now there, there, there's some evidence of it, but not across the board. What it means that is that we work in very multicultural spaces where we have con these kinds of conversations with, with folks like you all, but then we have another job on top of that where we have to build based on the notion that nobody's gonna hear you. Most of the work that I do as a festival director at Haiti Heritage uh, Center, I don't get paid for so that you know the resources the amount of resources that come from me is is astounding and it's not sustainable and so i just want you my colleagues just to be aware of that i have um and and this is not to take anything away from the wonderful work that any of you are doing now but just understand that the conversation that's happening in the streets of America is also happening within television and film. And I hope that the work that we're doing um, in this body helps to advance that because your work is being impacted by that, whether you're acknowledging it or not. You know, not acknowledging the fact that we do not have diverse crews. We do not have diverse sets. We do not have a diverse amount of people who have access to the resources affects your work, uh, both from uh, the creative standpoint and also uh, the personal moral standpoint. So I'll just leave that there. And um, I, I, I'm ready to move forward with uh, whatever we can do as a body to really help further this conversation. Thank you. One, uh, Lana, to your point, one thing I've noted over the last uh, week or so, <clears throat> well, it's really only been maybe even just a few days, is all of the streaming services are now um, on their base platform when you when you pull up their site, are all messaging um uh diversity and inclusion and black lives matter and we stand with you and um offering content that addresses social justice issues um for free in some cases is this a good start um is this something that north carolina could play on as well for work that is done in the state um Anybody want to jump in on that? Some of the some of the bigger uh, folks associated with Netflix and other entities that have made this decision, which is unique. We've not seen that before, unless I'm mistaken. I, I can respond. I've noticed the same thing. And when you pull, it's a huge marketing expense to actually get your programming to the top of the page so that people aren't trying to find it. Uh, this kind of content has usually been buried. So people are watching stuff because it's at the front because they wouldn't have looked because they wouldn't have seen it. And so it's, it's a, 
it's a commitment that can lead to change. And to Lana's comment, um, at the School of the Arts, you know, we're talking a lot about making commitments, assessing our partnerships, uh, looking for areas where we can have more sustainability so that this movement doesn't lose momentum. I think that's really, really important. Where do we put you know, our money where our mouth is? Where do we put our resources, our energy to make sure that these kinds of initiatives have that sustainability? And to see that on the streaming platforms was really uh, an interesting, great moment. So I, I, I recognize that as well. Uh, this is David Burris. I think, I think you make a really uh, great point in terms of recognizing that with regards to our, our industry it is connected to a larger web of the economy and the resource resources uh, on a larger on a macro scale the last the last uh, big project i did we filmed down in atlanta and i was there for about four or five months and the um in terms of the human resources uh our set was incredibly diverse i would say 40 to 50 percent split and that is uh, to my point connected to the larger initiatives in atlanta in terms of getting people of color involved in the industry but in the economy as as a whole and however we can if we could come up with some sort of initiative that that reflects that and has our industry specifically in North Carolina connected to larger initiatives about making uh, people of color uh, part of the larger economy and part of the larger workforce um, I think that would be one way to view it, view it and one way to action that idea which I think is incredibly important I know we joke a little bit about uh, in, uh, being jealous or envious of Georgia and, and, and some of their initiatives, but in all seriousness, not only the way that they've built the industry as a whole, but the way that they have integrated the industry, at least as far as my, you know, about a half a year's involvement in, in the business down there uh, was, was truly impressive. And just to jump on that, uh, David, that work doesn't happen overnight um and so we have to start i'm going to say with middle school and high school students to let them know that these careers even exist um and to prepare them so that when they do come in they come in fully capable of doing the necessary work college students as well and just uh, doing whatever we can to um reach out and um you know cultivate that talent pool that's not going to just again show up overnight um so there's some some longer term solutions that we need to be ready to roll up our sleeves and do some work on that's a great point a lot of the a lot of the crew that i had were from from the institutions of higher learning actually that had media programs and film and television programs uh clark uh spellman morehouse um so that that's an upstream concept and a downstream concept in terms of education. I think you're spot on. Um, I think the education part is the uh, smaller issue here. Um, I'm an educator, and so I've run into, and I know at least in this area, of uh, the uh, young people of color who are trained meaning that they've been uh, trained on the university level to do this kind of work. There's no dearth of talent. What ha the problem is when they graduate, there's nowhere for them to go. So uh, the students that I interact with either leave the state or they, uh, they, they find something for a while and then transition out of uh, content creation. So I think it's more of an issue of workforce development than it is of training and education, because they're already trained and educated. Uh, you just <clears throat> brought up a point that shouldn't be overlooked. And one of the reasons why we're all together is that 
there's not as much work here as there is in Atlanta. We need to generate not just indigenous work, but to go back to where we were um, before the previous administration came in, where we were actually challenging the state of Georgia. People were, you know, I've worked in, uh, I'm on my 18th film in Atlanta, Georgia right now. Um, and there's a reason why I'm there. It's because that's where the work is. And we need to generate more work and put more people to, to work here. Um, and that just, that will help. I mean, the, the university system is great. I don't deny its validity. Um, I don't work with a huge amount. I, I would say the, the majority of the people that I work with on films, on a film set, uh, come through, through not an apprenticeship, but, but hands-on being on a set, starting as a PA or having a relative that's a grip or whatever. Though That's the majority of the people that I work with. And the more people that are employed, you know, the more work there is, the more people that are going to get employed. And regrettably here, uh, you know, I live in Wilmington. Um, I haven't worked here forever, but, you know, there's a handful of people that work and that's it because there's not enough to sustain more people. So I think that by generating more work across the state, we'll put more people to work and that organically will help the situation in total. Um, not to say that that's the only answer for sure. Um, I know in Atlanta, I have a, a great group of people that I work with consistently and we all help each other and work with each other. And, and um, I used to have that here. So uh, I think if we can get more work, we can put more people to work. I'd like to speak up as an uh, independent filmmaker and producer. Um, I think we need to work on every level from getting the big blockbuster work back here to supporting more independent films, projects of, of smaller sizes as large as well as larger sizes, just to get that full range of projects going, which would include more, more diverse voices. And also that can be nimble things that can address current issues by being produced more rapidly. And don't neglect what you can do on an individual level. Um, I've served as executive producer for three films, just as a person, as myself. Um, two of those are um, stories about Black history in America and um, The Rape of Recy Taylor, which was produced, was created by a lot of people from North Carolina, is actually um, one of the films being shown on Stars now in the Black history section. So that was made by people in North Carolina. That's now one of the films that is teaching the nation and the world. Um, and I had the pleasure of working with Eric on uh, Olympic Pride American Prejudice. Um, another great film about untold stories in African American history. I was able to do that as I was able to play my role in that just as a person. So for you know, as an individual. So for everyone on this call, for the white people, for the white people on the call in particular, I would ask, what can we do to help move this forward by supporting projects of people of color, uh, by listening, by uh, listening and learning, by supporting you know, putting our money, putting our time into projects where we might not be the the star, the director, but we can all do something to forward those. And that has honestly been one of the best experiences of my whole life and, and why I, I got into filmmaking. And um, you will, you know, it's not doing anyone a favor except like it, it is, it will develop you as a person. It will strengthen our community. Um, and I really think North Carolina could be a leader in this. Um, so I'm just glad we're all together. I'm really glad we took the time to have this conversation. I just wanted to follow up on uh, what, what Tim said. I think he's absolutely right. The opportunities for a diverse workforce in North Carolina are directly related to the amount of work. I mean, that's how you develop the programs. It's how you support the programs. IETSE in North Carolina is not as diverse as it could be. And that is across the board uh, with color, 
with sex, all of it. Uh, we could do better, but it's going to take all of you guys to help us do that and also get more work to the state of North Carolina across the state of North Carolina, not just in the Wilmington market where the stages are, but in the Charlotte market, in the triad. So, I mean, the opportunity is in front of us if we all figure it out. It's true. Darla, were you, yes. you were going to talk about, hopefully if you were able, something you had started that got interrupted, I think, because of yeah, COVID? Yeah. Yes, we, we definitely, uh, you know, we, we cover part of uh, Georgia, we cover the Savannah market. And so we work really closely with SCAD down there. And we also work with the Georgia Film Academy, which is a program, it's a job creation program. And so we kind of started trying to mirror that here with Cape Fear. Now, it, we, we got to our second meeting right before COVID hit. So we'll resume that as soon as it's safe and, and keep that conversation going. But that's what we're trying to do. And it was not necessarily focused on diversity, but we're certainly going to be inclusive of that. Uh, that's one of our, our goals for this year. Hopefully we get it done. Hopefully. We can always work with the school, the, the uh, school of the arts too. That'd be great. Can I also say that um, this notion that we need to bring more work to the state in order to um, kind of to diversify the field? I, I want to also add that uh, bring, bringing work to the state, that, that is always a great thing. But also, there are people making careers here um, in uh, other way, uh, other forms of content creation. So it's not just about bringing work to the state. It's also about having uh, local uh, companies that are work that are doing work in corporate video, um, online advertising to hire people of color. Um, I'm a part of a collective, a multiracial collective called Kaleida here in uh, Durham. And I see who's getting the work. Um, and there are plenty of folk who can make a career and feed their families based on just doing a lot uh, corporate work in between the independent work. So, so you know, that's also, a, a, you need to add that to the mix. Um, we're not, as, as independent filmmakers, we're, we're not always just waiting for the work to come in to get the freelance gigs. It's also um, who locally, what are the small boutique uh, or medium-sized production companies that are hiring uh, so that, you know, we can still draw an income and do the craft and, and perform the craft while also working in our own time on independent filmmaking. Okay, anybody else want to share? I think this uh, conversation is a perfect segue into the next part of our agenda. Um, where we're going to be talking about the, the subcommittees, the breakout groups and preparation of the report uh, to the governor. And I think we should start with diversity and inclusion um, with the understanding that the notes that were taken when we were last together obviously are going to be affected by the things that have happened in between. Um, if you all don't mind, uh, I'm going to share this conversation with the governor. I think that um, he will be moved and impressed by the things that you've had to share. Obviously, Governor Cooper is incredibly committed to diversity and inclusion. We're going to talk about his latest executive order toward the end of the agenda. Um, but he um, is very committed to the issue. Uh, we speak about it frequently among the cabinet agencies, and it's our commitment. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Swain and she can get us started. Thanks, everybody. Good morning. Thank you, Secretary. Um, so I wanted to take the next hour um, to run through some of the things that came out of the breakout groups so that we could add to them, 
agree on them, discuss openly, um, so that we can, from this meeting, take all of this information and start working on presenting it to the governor in such a way uh, that it reflects, I think, our recommendations, our insights, um, and add value to his leadership team as they move us forward in North Carolina. Um, so I, I think, you know, one of the, the first breakout groups that we had was around diversity and, you know, a lot has happened. I mean, the Governor Cooper did uh, put out Executive Order 143 that really lays a foundation for actions across the state to change, to do better, to look at all parts of our state and to be more equitable. So um, some of the things that came out of that breakout group are obviously um, mentoring programs, um, workforce development, and, and then, um, you know, let's, let's talk about some of the executive orders and how we can build on those particularly for film and digital streaming. So, um, you know, it, June is LGBTQ month. We have anti-discrimination, uh, things that have dealt with gender equality, uh, wage equity, uh, meaningful work opportunities. Um, what, what, how can we put these things into action for this industry in particular? And if someone that was on that uh, particular breakout group wants to speak to the discussion, I wanted us all to kind of hear what came out of those conversations. I'll just add a, a couple of things. I don't, I don't remember everything we said, but um, I know that uh, we were gonna take a look at um, the union and the unions and, and take a look at, you know, where they um, can, where they are, and how we could possibly engage them such that, in a way such that uh, there is more inclusion. So uh, we had started a conversation around that. I have two things to say that are rather different. So point one and point two. Point one, um, I'm also interested in what what was what Lana said just a little while ago is what could we what could this group be doing to help people get that work that sustains them between feature films like what could be done that's not a huge initiative that doesn't require a lot of money necessarily but um you know is, is there something that can be done that that we could put into place um to help people find those jobs um, within the union or, and, and beyond the union as well. So that's point number one. Um, point number two, I know that this industry has felt the pain of um, the, the protests against transphobic bathroom laws. And I know that that's been hard, but I just want to say thank you to the state. I, thank you for that support. It does matter. Um, that sort of support to the LGBTQ community is the kind of thing that makes a difference between not just people working here or not, but people living here, people raising their children here. So I know that it has been been tough on the industry, but I just wanted to really personally say thank you for that because it does matter. Thank you. We talked, uh, another thing that came out of that uh, breakout group in particular was obviously um, something that we've touched on, which is expanding um, grant opportunities and uh, work opportunities across the board. So, you know, can there be more resources available for a variety of work? So it's just coming from one pool, but rather there is a commitment in place for. Uh, corporate work, you know, across the board in rural counties, working more closely with schools and, you know, are there ways that we can, as a network, build in stronger paths to meaningful work for our students? 
and I'll jump back in. I don't want to bury the lead on that. This is sort of the same point I said earlier when we started the conversation, but it did come up in this this committee as well, which is I do think we need an entirely separate program for smaller budget projects. So I'd like to see us discuss that as a major policy uh, initiative going forward because the current pro current program does not serve those small projects. I um, raise up uh, the model that's in New Orleans oftentimes because it seems to be working. Um, and there are different entities tasked with doing different things so that it's able to not only develop talent, but also uh, take it from funding all the way through distribution. And so there is a, a number of organizations that are, that are working together. There's the New Orleans Film Society, which also runs uh, the New Orleans Film Festival. There's NOVAC. NOVAC is uh, a training entity. And so they're a tiered system by which, um, you know, depending on your, your level of knowledge of equipment and production, it's, it, you, you advance up and you, you tear up. It's very similar to uh, the Danish Film Institute. Um, then there's um, Create Louisiana, and Create Louisiana is the funding arm. And so these entities have been able to, to be independent of each other, but then also uh, work with each other to kind of build a diverse pool of really, really great content makers. Um, and also they were able to come together to lobby the state for uh, better tax incentives and it worked. I, I echo that. I had a chance. That was one of my last trips um, prior to the shutdown to New Orleans and learned about some of those entities. And I think one of the advantages of this um, new world we're in right now is we're all comfortable doing these online meetings. Um, this is important work. And I know we have a, a regular meeting schedule, but like many things that matter, especially a film or television or something like that, you do the work when it has to be done. So. I would um, challenge us or you know, just ask that we look into the opportunity of either a subgroup of us or anyone who's interested to sometime as soon as possible, reach out to them. I think Lana has some contacts, I do, and I know maybe others do. Let's get them on a call like this and let's just listen. Let's learn from them so we can leapfrog ahead instead of reinventing the wheel. And perhaps we do the same thing with Atlanta. Just get a group of folks, spend an hour, online with them and just ask them to share and um and do this work in between these meetings um because we need progress now the opportunities now tying this back into COVID. if we do everything right north carolina stands to really take a lead as we could potentially be one of the first areas that can open up more fully to production and I know, you know, we're getting calls from New York and L.A. wondering, you know, when our stages are going to open and that sort of thing. So if we can get our act together sooner than later, we can, um, I hate to say it this way, but uh, take advantage of, of the current situation that we were all smart enough to live and build a, a life here in North Carolina. And I agree, um, North Carolina can absolutely go toe to toe with Georgia if we were, you know, ha had the same playing field. Um, so the degree that we can make some progress this week, this month, this summer, um, could really make a difference in a way that is better than what we've ever had. Um, so I say that to say that we should get on some of these initiatives pronto. Thank you. I know that um, I think anybody on this call would make themselves available for those so we can maybe put together a short list and start um, having those discussions. Yeah, and Catherine, if I and may, we'll some, oh, sorry, some of those discussions have taken place, in particular with Novak. I think that Eric's point on if you get on the same playing field as some of those competitive states does make a difference. Uh, in particular with Novak, we were lining up a project uh, with one of the bigger productions that was going to be here 
that was a um, internship slash apprenticeship program specifically for uh, minority students. Um, and then the project did not get renewed uh, for uh, future production. And so, you know, all the work that went in, the getting ready to select people to participate uh, because of there not being the constant flow of projects, and it, it just fell uh, at, at that point. And, and um, we kind of, from a state film office standpoint, even though it's not necessarily my charge, it's, it is an area, uh, I've talked with Darla on many occasions and several others about workforce development and trying to get that going. And we keep somewhat getting presented with this chicken or the egg um, you know, proposition of there's not enough work to justify doing bigger workforce development uh, programs. Um, but then we turn around and say, but if we've got more people that are ready, then that's a bigger attract, uh, attractor for those that uh, would be doing the work um, on it. So it's definitely, I do want to say that, you know, there, there, there are some, but Eric, I think your point on a level playing field is is huge because, you know, again, while I fully recognize that there are indigenous filmmakers in the state, uh, when you look at how both Louisiana and Georgia really jump started their uh, film industry statewide, it was with the studio projects and, um, you know, their state has made available more resources more funding for those projects, funding for infrastructure um, even. Uh, and that's something that North Carolina, unfortunately, has not done or, and or has not stepped up uh, just yet with it. Can I say to that point, uh, uh, thank you for saying that. That, that gives additional insight. And um, that's to see how the state is thinking about that. Um, I want to also say that within indigenous and, and just BIPOC communities, uh, we're definitely not waiting for that to come through. So we're finding ad hoc ways to do that kind of workforce development. Um, at Haiti, uh, we got a little bit of money from the Mary Duke Biddle Foundation for, for training and um, work in progress development. So um, from the independent standpoint, you know, we know we're not going to be pulled in pretty much on, on those bigger uh, projects. But in terms of our own work, um, we, we've been able and successful at raising a little bit of money for training. Last two weekends ago, we had uh, Carol Kirshner, who runs the CBS and Writers Guild Diversity Showrunner Program. And she taught a workshop, a half-day workshop on uh, 10 essential things you, you need to know to make killer content. And um, we did that through the Hey Thai Black Filmmakers Collective, opened it up to everyone so anybody could, could participate in that. Um, so we are finding ha um, ad hoc ways to do that because we can't wait. Mm -hmm. uh, for the state to be in a position to to offer those types of things. So those things are happening in pocket. So I just wanted to add that, uh, offer that up. Lana, as, as those events happen, and, and those of you in other parts of the state as well, how are you reaching out to additional communities to, to make that information known? Um, you know, one of the things I've also struggled with uh, at the state office has been uh, local filmmakers saying, hey, how can you help promote my project? And the first thing I actually say to them is, well, can you tell me about your project? I don't know about your project. You're, you know, ha help me uh, help you, you know, in, in telling that story. So I, I guess, you know, with some of you, uh, Eric, not to point a finger, you know, but I know that when, uh, uh, Trailblazer didn't necessarily qualify for the revamped uh, grant program. Um, I don't hear from you guys on what projects you may be working on, uh, how we could help show that there is more 
to the industry than just um, you know Warner Brothers coming in and and doing a film or a TV series. Um, you know, how, how are you helping spread the word? And you know, how how can how can we um, both the state office, but then also I think uh, Secretary Hamilton would agree, maybe even with this advisory council. How can we be brought more into the fold or into the loop so that we can help, um, you know, be a megaphone for you as well? Thank you, Guy. That actually, I think, is a good segue into kind of our other uh, category of recommendations, which is around messaging and marketing and elevating North Carolina's voice in film and also bringing the community, all aspects of the community together more often to keep up, you know, things happen quickly and it, it's hard to um, keep it all um, cataloged, if you will. So uh, some of the recommendations that came out of our previous meetings around that was obviously um, <clears throat> continuing to do this work. And I would say that I know um, this council is a huge part of that, which is updating messaging to reflect North Carolina as a welcoming and a safe state with updated information from actions being taken. Um, and all of the good things, I don't think we all, you know, we don't always talk about all the positive things that are happening or opportunities or even the small steps. Um, one, one idea that came out was um, to implement focus groups of decision makers that address current perceptions of North Carolina, facts about projects that have chosen to film in North Carolina and identified, identified barriers, uh, tours to highlight past films, filming locations, um, consider ho holding an event which I don't, we, that could look a lot of different ways. It could be a video, it could be virtual could be a series of micro events um, to really highlight North Carolina and the people who filmed here and why and the types of projects. And then creating these messaging opportunities to niche audiences for content makers, studios, scouts, producers, and legislators, et cetera, to show the full range, highlighting blue collar trades, data from film graduates, addressing you know very head on, diversity, equity, inclusion issues through content creation and messaging and maximizing outreach opportunities with film, influ film influencers from our state, those who travel through our state and are tied to the state but obviously may live elsewhere. And I, I know one of the questions that Secretary Hamilton wanted to kind of ask of this council is who are those people who can help us tell this story? Um, if we have an opportunity to work with a billboard or variety or, you know, some, you know, large platforms where we may be able to update North Carolina's film story, who, who should be doing that? And, you know, I'm including all of you as who's, um, but who else within our networks would be good voices to help us update our story. This is Lindy here. I, um, it, yeah, I have always thought that the School of Filmmaking um, at the School of the Arts when I was chancellor and now was a hugely under leveraged asset in that regard. We did a couple of things when I was there that were really uh, powerful for the institution that I think could be used to benefit the state. One was we began a program and I fundraised a very modest amount of money at the time, but I think a program through the, through the School of Filmmaking that raised money, let's say it's an endowment, to support um, uh, filmmakers who have just graduated from the program um, and it would be a, a grant program. Um, and perhaps the grant is awarded by a, a jury of people on this call um, so that we can uh, so that the state can sort of be branded as or be known as a place that incubates young diverse talent and so we had on the 
on the campus, a group, uh, artists of color. And, um, you know, we had uh, gone to um, Paul Taswell, the costume designer for Hamilton and The Wiz on television and others, and had uh, a scholarship specifically for uh, artists of color in, in the School of Design and Production. I think you could develop something similar in the School of the Arts and in the School of Filmmaking and, and incentivize young filmmakers who, as a part of the, um, you know, perhaps one, you know, one thing we did is we had a fifth year fellowship that Filmmakers came out. They spent a year developing um, video assets for uh, to help promote the institution and tell our story. And I mean, these were things like um, we had young filmmakers, you know, capturing all sorts of content that was widely shared across uh, social media and helped really build awareness. It was really powerful. So I think to me that seems like a way that, without having to ask the legislature for a huge amount of money, perhaps we could fundraise for that endowment um, and support content creation for young filmmakers who are already here and want to stay here. And even in my role at UNC TV, I, I've had alumni coming out of the woodwork um, from places like New York and Los Angeles because they just want to get out uh, and they want to come back here. They love it here. And I would think that um, the School of Filmmaking is also at a competitive advantage in terms of the low cost of tuition even for compared to private schools if you're out of state. Uh, so if you're a student who um, you know can't afford seventy thousand dollars a year for a school in Los Angeles, uh, there may be ways to incentivize those incentivize those filmmakers, um, people of color to, to come to North Carolina um, and you know they would find a and we would be able to support um, launching their work and career. We're talking about a potential platform to tell these stories. Um, where would that be? Might it be um, might it be the North Carolina Film website? Might that become a portal of uh, where folks in the industry can look um, for these stories, success stories, initiatives. Yes, um, you know I some would of think, the workshops. Well, I, I, yeah, I would actually, I would, I would think that uh, public media would be a good place to start. You know, if we could develop a platform, uh, whether it's, I mean, PBS has uh, has had huge success, and it's still beta, but uh, on the YouTube platforms. And I think that there's an opportunity there in collaboration um, uh, for us to develop a, a platform that is, you know, I think free and accessible is important. And I think we, um, you know, we could work with the department and many of you uh, to develop a platform. And then I think, you know, through the PBS system, we could uh, talk to PBS leadership and look at uh, some of this, some of uh, some of these projects may um, they may be something that is aimed at local or regional audiences, but then some I think would be relevant to national audiences, and that's where you know we we can pitch them directly to PBS, and they could get natural uh, national distribution potentially. I think. Um, Thank you, Lindsay. I think that getting the word out and messaging out is done by earning that. And, and what I mean by that is that the state probably has to get out into the community a little bit more to see where those um, places of <clears throat> success and where those areas of success are happening. Um, because if I start, if I'm thinking about just the community in the triangle, and I think of kind of putting out messaging that the state is the place to be, um, the filmmakers are going to start, quite frankly, rolling their eyes up in their heads. It's a, it's, 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 it's going to that that messaging is somewhat tone deaf right now. Because right now the feeling is that the state is not the place to be uh, for a lot of people. I, I, you know, everybody kind of has that kind of feeling in 
the world of independent film. So I feel like you first have to earn that. And then, um, you know, once you, and, and there was, a, there was a, a point in time when UNC TV did these listening sessions. They went around the state and they listened to communities of uh, independent filmmaking to ask, well, you know, where's the breakdown? Why are we not, why don't we have any of your content uh, on the network? And um, they, you know, took some hits. They really, really were very brave and they really listened to what the independent filmmaking community was saying. And so that's when things started to shift. Rachel Rainey came on board with Real South and um, you started to see more uh, content from local filmmakers or state filmmakers. Um, so I think that's the kind of work that needs to happen to be able to stand by the statement that this is the place to be. Um, and I think kind of trying to put the cart before the horse um, may be a little premature. I feel like there is some, there, there is value in messaging uh, that may uh, state, you know, we we're, we see you, we hear you, we're working at uh, trying to develop the infrastructure so that it is that place. I think we have to be very honest. And so, yes, and I uh, think, go ahead. Well, I was just going to add, I think that um, the state can potentially uh, be a workforce to help tell those North Carolina stories. So building um, content development budgets and the opportunities to utilize state assets to help kind of tell these stories in the right voice is, an op is a potential opportunity. Yes, it's, a it's, it's an opportunity if the, if the messaging matches up with what the people who are creating the content are experiencing. Exactly. Okay. Uh, I always go back to North Carolina state motto, which is to be rather than to seem. So we always have to be what we say and not just say what we want. I agree there. Uh, Lindsay, again, I agree with everything said. I, part of our campaign, part of our campaign goals, we're just in very early stages of the feasibility study, but part of our campaign goals would be an endowment uh, to support content development um, to do exactly what you're saying. And it would, it, you know, because the biggest problem that I have now is for every, I, you know, people hate public media because every, you know, they come and they bring ideas and they're like, okay, oh, great, we love it. Go, go find the money for it. You know, and, it, and it's, you know, so it always, it, it's, you know, I think we have a moral obligation to, um, you know, to not put it on the filmmaker, who's especially somebody who's just starting out, to say, okay, good luck finding the money, you know, come back to us when you get it. Um, I think we can actually raise the money and do, you know, the equivalent of, I don't know exactly how the model works for Masterpiece, but it's, you know, the British dramas, right? Like there's, there's the Masterpiece Trust, and there's a lot of people who've contributed to that trust, and that supports, you know, content development for programs like Downton Abbey and others. So I think we could do the equivalent for, I would like to do, it is my goal to do the equivalent, um, to have a, uh, an endowment uh, through private support um, to, to, um, to support um, content development. Um, and, and, I, and I think that's going to take time, obviously, but um, we're in the initial stages and I don't have no idea how much we can actually raise. But again, I think a combination of public and private, through a combination of public and private support, um, we can get there. We can get there. Thank you. Can I just say that um, that regret uh, Tim, you muted yourself. Can you hear me? Hello? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, putting incentives aside because I've preached this for a number of years in this council, is that if you provide money, um, <clears throat> people are going to come. It doesn't matter whether they want to or not. I've done many films in, in uh, Georgia that had nothing to do with Georgia. So, I mean, 
that's the bottom line. I'm never going to change that story. Whatever we do doesn't matter. If you pay them, they will come. And that's just, that's it. That being said, what can we do to help? Is there a way? You're muted again. Damn. I, I have this touch pad that, like, I don't have to touch it. It does it by itself. Um, is there a way, and I'm not, I don't understand necessarily the inner workings of government and funding and what have you, but we are a council. Um, we're an advisory council. Is there a way, we're talking about endowments from private funds. Um, I know Todd Thorne has brought up the Gold Leaf Society. There's got to be things out there where where money can be made available to do something like, and this is a, uh, just an idea of of a contest of some kind, um, eliciting famous North Carolinians, like and the only one that comes to mind immediately is Andy McDowell, but to be sort of a, almost like a voice television uh, competition or or something like that, where it's, it's more interesting than just, um, you know, just stories about, you know, Merle Fest or, or whatever, but like get into every part of the state, urban, um, rural, um, having people, <clears throat> having a, a competition that would generate interest, not just in North Carolina and the smaller areas of North Carolina, which we, we still struggle to <clears throat> explain to them why this is important to them as well as you know the centers uh the triad or wilmington or charlotte or Asheville, um to generate sort of a movement a dialogue that that brings it to the forefront and get famous north carolinian filmmakers that may or may not live here but to promote that um to to get up in front of a camera and and funding that through a government fund of some kind, and it doesn't have to be a lot of money. I mean, people make films with practically nothing. It's their, it's their, you know, ingenuity that that you know that makes things great a lot of times, and 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 how they make a lot with a little, and 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 promoting that sort of almost like in a project green light type of environment where we're creating something, we're creating a buzz. We're creating interest, not just for North Carolina, but also out of North Carolina as well. Um, people, we haven't gotten, and maybe this is used, whatever the final, maybe there's a, maybe there's a, um, a central point that we're focusing on a message that we give uh, to each of the filmmakers or, or or whatever maybe we don't do that maybe it's just um a story about a family or, or a neighborhood or um you know um there was a great story about the camden it was a camden police department i think that um got into neighborhood policing and how that's worked and transformed a city that's just was the worst in the in the country is now the best things like that stories like that that not just are important and interesting to North Carolinians, but to the country as a whole, and therefore getting the, the word out uh, in that regard. And then the question would become, um, you know, who governs that, who who accepts, uh, I think there's a, I, I haven't watched Project Greenlight, but one time, so I, I'm not really sure, but who decides who that is? Is there a, is there a group of us or a group of other people? Maybe it's the, the, famous North Carolinian filmmakers, uh, whoever they are, that, that, that act as judges or whatever, but some kind of a program that just brings excitement, brings buzz um, in a creative way to the state. Um, and then one thing I wanted to say, and Johnny can, I, I don't know the inner workings of this, but having been um, approached by not North Carolina only, but other states that I've been to um, where people have asked if we could put uh, interns from higher education institutions on our movies, um, which I think is a really good idea in the effort of getting on onset training, which is invaluable. Um, and the stumbling block has always been from the studio point of view an insurance situation um 
I think some of that was relieved at one point by getting school credit or whatever, but that might be something to revisit also in getting more people from all the different universities, not just School of the Arts, not just, but like NC State, like even the community college, anywhere. But making it easier for, or making it harder, I should say, for studios to not come up with some reason why that's not possible. And therefore, by getting more people from our state, more training from our institutions into actual onset experiences, um, and cracking that code uh, so that the studios have no way of saying that it won't work. Um, you know, and how these, then the, I could go on, but I won't. But just an idea of, uh, you know, I, I've, I've touted like getting the legislators, um, you know, a DVD of information so that they can share that with their people in their hometowns about why this industry is good. Maybe that's, I, you know, I, I hate to do it that way because people have so many great stories um, in their own lives. And that's and I think that showing North Carolina from an individual's lens, wherever that person is from or whatever their experience is more important than specifically making a um, uh, uh, what do you call those public? Uh, yeah. So yeah. but um, just getting getting people involved from each part of the from our state regardless of who they are where they're from what their experiences are but allowing them an opportunity those that may not have an opportunity mm -hmm. like otherwise because of where they're at you know and, and giving them an opportunity to share a story and open that up to literally everybody somehow um and funding it Okay, fine, a GoFundMe page or or a private donation, but also is there something that we can do governmentally uh, through one of these other endowments to get that kick started? Yeah, that's all. Thank you. Well, I think that's a good uh, segue into the you know grants, rebates, you know funding uh, section uh, and you know, some of the things that obviously came up from those breakout groups it was broad, obviously, you know, um, creating more revenue sources, making um, return to the former tax credit incentive program, um, having more diverse uh, grant programs, um, and maybe eliminating some of the language that becomes a barrier. Um, Guy, you can probably, um, you know speak to some of the things that you hear the most but you know where do we start on um, making recommendations that will help us you know get more money more work projects going sorry about that i think tim you know nailed it on as long as we're talking about these these bigger more recognizable projects that if money is there people will come and studios frequently force filmmakers to go to a destination that they really don't want to go to in order to make a film so there's a reason that there are people in atlanta making films as if they're in at the north or south pole and that's because their incentive there in Atlanta or in Georgia has had this studio kind of shoehorn. You're going to make this here and figure figure out how um, with it. I, you know, prior to COVID-19, I told you guys when we last met, I fully expected us to uh, run out of funds in the grant program um, for this fiscal year when we uh, hit. COVID-19, all projects stopped, as as most of you are aware, and, and there was a stumble. I think that there is a 75% uh, chance that we'll probably get this last uh, amount of money uh, assigned, if you will, um, before the end of the fiscal year, but it would have been something that took place in April 
uh, before. And certainly there is more and more interest um, coming up that I will address in the, the film office report. Uh, so, I, I mean, ultimately the studios keep coming back and saying, look, tell us what you have, we'll figure it out uh, in, in a way. And, um, you know, being able to have the open sign on, if you will, is a is a huge marketing uh, tool for us. Being able to say, yes, we have money uh, and we can accept new projects makes the interest continue, uh, keeps projects looking at us. Um, and that is a reality uh, that I think we're going to face sooner than later right now with our current program um, and uh, the 31 allocation. Now, I know that there are several of us that are working on how do we combat that uh, and there will probably be a solution, but uh, you know, for right now, um, there is the issue. I also completely hear the independent filmmakers that are um, part of this council, and and ha I think the first time we met, I acknowledged our program does not work for independent features. Um, that uh, the the traditional independents now. Uh, you can start making arguments that the things like uh, with searchlight pictures and those, whether or not those are independents. Uh, but, you know, for $3 million buy-in for independent feature is high. So I think that that's one of the other areas in terms of access to the program. Um, and that was what, you know, that that committee, you know, spoke of. Um, I was there more to answer questions and to help dictate. So I'd love if any of the uh, folks that were on that breakout group wanted to speak out more, um, you know, with it, because certainly what I'm charged with, you know, is, is those bigger projects and that's where I could continue to talk. But I know that there were discussions with uh, other ends as well. Yeah. Thank you, Guy. And I'll add that the North Carolina Arts Council is also looking at diversifying their grant programs so that they can work with more independent filmmakers. And I did put um, a document that they had started um, in the Google Share Drive. And so you know, I think we can build on those to identify, um, you know, people that can speak to um, what's happening and also um, different kind of networks of groups and film festivals and people so that we can help inform the Arts Council as they kind of revamp their, their program for more independent filmmakers. So, you know, having kind of multiple programs at different levels um, is really the only way to meet the market where it is. Um, and then, you know, I know we talked a lot about in that breakout group, particularly about the harmful to minors clause, you know, what types of language are barriers, things that would be game changers that might be, you know, uh, feasible. I'm going to ask a possibly a stupid question, but, um, or a difficult one, but in terms of the grant, the current grant and the thresholds that are set, what would it take to make an adjustment? So um, a lower budget film or uh, episodes of a series, um, you know, right now the, the threshold is a million dollars per episode and there's a lot of potential episodic content that a Netflix or an Apple would be interested in, but the budgets for those would be 250, 300,000 per episode. Now the season would be well over a million dollars, but that current threshold of a million per episode outrules a lot of content that very easily, well, I won't say very easily, but more likely could be made because it doesn't require large sets and large crews. So again, another opportunity for, for North Carolina to sneak ahead and be attractive mm -hmm. to these streamers who are now seeing that people have an appetite um, for multi-part series. Um, so is that something that would be a, a big deal yeah. to make adjustments on those thresholds or is that something within range? Um, I think that those changes cannot be made until the grant itself is addressed and that we get the money to bring back an industry and we're not there yet. Um, you know, I think that, it, that 
including everyone, including those independent films is definitely a goal. But I think that um, at this point, we have at best a very lagging industry in this state. And we've got to figure out how to get that back. Well, and there's two sides to that coin because we have an industry that we're ignoring, which I think to Eric's point, we're ignoring them. Broad City would not be made here because, you know, something as successful as Broad City is episodic. We train people to do things for a lot cheaper than the threshold of, of the incentive. And if you incentivize people to stay, they'll stay and they'll grow. Um, so it's two sides of that coin. Uh, I just wanted to take the, an opportunity to address that platform question of the last segment. Uh, international film festivals are the platform. Um, UNCSA could celebrate filmmakers from North Carolina that are not part of the UNCSA community and use UNCSA and its sponsorship of Sundance to bring filmmakers who wouldn't have gotten there on their own to start celebrating independent voices. So there's the marketing aspect, there's the uh, films that are already made here that we can push out there to celebrate North Carolina, which you know earns our keep in the marketing, um, while we're also developing these incentive programs. Uh, the other part of the incentive program is what incentives incentivize private industry to partner I'm particularly a fan of transferable tax credits because it gets uh, local corporations involved with filmmakers that then have a longevity of relationship. I've been able to raise lots of equity financing based upon having met a, com uh, a company that was interested in transferable tax credits that I couldn't use. So um, there's all aspects of it, and we have to think about the promotion, we have to think about the development, and we have to think about debt financing. We have to think about longevity of partnerships. Um, and I think um, UNCSA can actually, we already have notoriety. We are already uh, have interest from, you know, all the major studios saying, what's the next new voice? We can celebrate our own, and we can celebrate our own being North Carolina. I'd like to just jump in on the tax credit situation. Um, uh, when Governor Purdue, at the end of her tenure, um, we were so close. Uh, North Carolina was getting so close to actually becoming a challenge, a challenge to Georgia. And the main reason for that would be um, you know, we you, you have thirty percent basically rebate from Georgia, um, but it is a tax credit, and therefore it has to be sold if you don't have an entity. I think Warner Brothers had an entity, so they never had to sell it. But because most people don't have a, a tax liability in the state of Georgia, you have to sell these credits, and by doing so, you reduce what your takeaway is, what your, your net profit is going, or the net rebate is going to be. We got so close because ours was a check. You got the 25%, it, there wasn't, you know, you didn't have to take a hit from selling it to, uh, you know, Corning or whatever. Um, and so that was how we were getting closer to uh, challenge Georgia, because we weren't challenging, um, the actual percentage itself, although it was getting closer, and B, you know, we do have that cap uh, on the above the line salaries of a million dollars, or we had it at that time. So, um, but that was immaterial because we weren't attracting the types of, of projects here that that really were injured by that, which, uh, you know, we, everybody here was working, uh, television, smaller budgeted shows where people weren't making over a million dollars. So my point is this, is that by going to a rebate situation, you're kind of like now you're into Georgia's world, whereas we one of our strengths was you didn't have to do that. That's all. So I would just be careful of that. Yeah, I, I just want to make the, uh, the comment that Louisiana, 
and actually Georgia for a period of time, I think they might have changed at some point, but definitely Louisiana understood very quickly that to compete with Georgia, they had to allow the filmmaker the choices. So they did both a refund and a deduction. And uh, I think they also did a, a rebate. So they had all three types. Um, and it's a cash flow issue, and it really depends upon how you set up your financing. So if I need the cash now and I can sell the, uh, the credit, um, then perhaps I have a, a partner. But it was my choice how I wanted to set it up. So here I also used the tax credit, and that helped me a, a lot, but it was a refund, and I had to wait a year. So then I would have to debt finance against the the that cap that cash if I needed that money up front. So the best case scenario is the most flexibility for the filmmaker or the financier to make the decision about how they want to cash flow it. Thank you. Let me, uh, we've got about 10 more minutes before Guy's presentation. Um, and I'll run through some of the industry expansion notes, which were uh, implementing construction incentives to allow for big spaces unoccupied to be repurposed, really leveraging uh, state assets to be used for filmmakers, everything from objects to archives to space that's available, um, simplifying the grant process. Um, and then, um, of course, we talked about the, the platform uh, needed to really promote North Carolina films, filmmakers, connections. Um, and I think that that is something we can do very quickly. And then, of course, um, diversify funding sources um, and also making the permitting process easier when we talk about um, the opportunity to do more film work in tier one and two, you know tier two and two, tier three counties, what we've heard is that that permitting process can be very challenging. And you know, can we can we just simplify some of these things? You know, if there's one thing that COVID has taught us is that we can change, and you know, um, we can adapt to new things. And so, you know, what bureaucratic paperwork systems can make it simpler so that work can happen more quickly and it's just you know more pleasant easier to get work done another thing that we addressed uh, i was in one of the grant um, groups is we addressed the problem with the cap and that issue because we are not able to attract some of the projects we want to track for the long term, we were only able with the cap, we tend to track more of the short term, and the long term would give us more infrastructure. The way this is, um uh, coming together in my head on on terms of the policy and the statutes related to the film grant program was we we had um, legislation that was in one of the many budgets, if you will, that uh, did not um, ulti ultimately become law. Um, and I think we've circulated that. If we haven't, we may want to circulate it again. Um, I want to make sure that that captures some of these issues related to the caps that Dale was just mentioning um, so that we can also fold into that the uh, independent, for lack of a better word, uh, smaller budget um, activities that are going on. Is that something that y'all think you would find useful? It's not a very long document. I mean, it changes the caps, it uh, eliminates the, um, the clause um, about, suitable for children or um, I can't remember the exact language, but would that be useful for everyone to see? Because I think it's an important piece of our final uh, presentation. Yeah, that would be great. This is Dave yeah. Burst again. I mean, having some understanding of where you guys 
have tried to go both with the ceiling and the floor. The ceiling, as someone pointed out earlier, with regards to having uh, longer term projects be able to be here and then the floor in terms of being able to have independent projects, but also I think to the uh, point of Broad City projects, people have gotten much, much more efficient in how they spend their money. So having some idea of where you guys uh, have tried to push those limits both up and down would be great. I would love to see that. Susie, uh, Secretary Hamilton, for clarification, are you meaning uh, legislation that's been proposed as part of the governor's uh, budget specifically no, or any and all the, legislation? It was the mini budget that was dealing with franchise fees. Okay. And I think it came out of the Senate. Julia tried to change it in the House. Um, I think it was unsuccessful. But um, nonetheless, we, we'll 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 let we'll the three of us, me, you, and Catherine, will talk about what I'm talking about before we send it to everybody. It's just a starting point, but I think it lays out exactly what we were all thinking because it was done uh, with some input early on, and and for what it's worth, we internally at DNCR had been discussing the possibility of a of a grant program specifically for uh, projects that can't meet that threshold. Um, and then we got hit with COVID-19. So um, that changes our position pretty dramatically. Before we go into Guy's presentation on um, kind of an update from the film office, um, does anyone want to add anything else to kind of some top level points? Obviously, we can get together and break out groups separately as we kind of formulate these recommendations, but uh, I wanted to just see if there's anything else that's popped up or things that you've seen come out of um, other states in the in the last few weeks that we might want to take a look at. Do we need to deal, this is a naive question on my part, but do we need to deal with virus, uh, virus uh, restrictions and how they affect shooting? And what to do about them? <clears throat> we could affect yes. them? Yes, Judy, I, yes. I think, you know, safe sets in an ongoing discussion. And so how do you build an equal level of confidence on any production scenario across the country? Um, and I think there was the um, there was a white paper distributed about some guidelines, which is really helpful. And I think, you know, North Carolina um, can, and with our collective help, can take that and maybe um, make one that's very specific to us. But I will speak to the program that um, Visit NC has kicked off uh, multiple state partners called Count On Me NC. And it is a um, course, you, it's a free course certification for business owners, lots of different entities um, to kind of everybody getting on the same page about public health and public safety. Um, please check it out. It's countonmenc.org. There are a, a just a ton of it. There's tons of information about um, from the CDC, from local um, health authorities, as well as um, course programs that have been developed that you can go through for multiple types of businesses. Uh, and I think that's a great start because it is. It's a it's a kind of a, a public pledge campaign for both business owners and consumers to say we're all going to help keep each other safe by doing these things. And I think that, of course, translates into business, filming and production, and, um, you know, still kind of working out how, what all those scenarios might look like. You know, how do you do someone's makeup and social distance, and uh, how does a grip work in those circumstances, et cetera? Um, also, Darla, um, didn't you all put out some standards for um, IOTC, 
Darla or Dale. I think I remember seeing those circulated. Yeah, I saw those. Um, I'm an IA member, and uh, there was a white paper distributed, I think, about a week ago. 22 page document. Yeah, it's, those are rec recommendations the, at this point. Right. There, um, and the negotiations between the guilds and unions and that white paper are still ongoing. Do you know when, Dale, when they might be finalized? What we're being told is maybe by the end of July. Is it a requirement for going back to work? Depends on who you talk to. Um, <laughs> I'm, hearing from, I'm hearing from some studios that yes, it will be a requirement. Um, you know, I'm hearing from other studios that they want to at least get up and running to start prepping. Um, it just will depend on on the uh, the company, I think. But it'll be late July at the earliest. Insurance coverage is a huge issue too. I mean, a lot of the carriers yes. aren't going to hear anything until yes. that solidified more. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, Amy. Uh, just to put my scientist hat on for a second, since that was my first career, I just encourage everyone to keep a really close eye on the the data in North Carolina. And, you know, Dr. Cohen has done a good job with that, and Governor Cooper has been out there with it. But please just do keep an eye on it. I think we need to be ad adaptable in the long run. And, um, you know, this is going to be something we're going to have to deal with for a long time. So even as we reopen and adapt and be safe, um, I just wanted to say that one time in this meeting that it's not over yet and it's something we're going to have to manage like a very chronic disease, I think, unfortunately. I wish, certainly wish that was not the case and I would love to be wrong, but just keep an eye on, on it yourselves. Thank you. Well, with that said, um, Guy, do you want to tell us what's been happening in your office since COVID came? Uh, Sure, so I'm gonna share my screen here. Um, I think it's gonna let me, will it? All right. So hopefully everyone's seeing, cause unfortunately it takes me out, but um, uh, so far with uh, 2020, uh, there have been 32 projects that have filed intent to film forms with the state. Uh, again, as a reminder, that intent to film uh, form is uh, asked that any production, be it a local $500 short uh, film or a um, you know major network series, uh, complete that intent to film just so that there's a record of the project with the state um, on that. Uh, and we've had five projects um, shooting or two shoot uh, that were uh, approved for the state's uh, grant rebate program. Uh, that's resulted in over 1,000 crew hires, over 600 talent opportunities, and more than, uh, and right at 3,600 extra opportunities. Um, and for the direct in-state spending, uh, we're hovering right around 80. Again, these are projections. Uh, some of the information that is included in this uh, were projects that were halted in the middle uh, due to COVID-19 um, and or, or projects that have said they are going to begin filming as soon as uh, the various uh, industry associations or whatever uh, sign off and give the green light for starting to film. Uh, so as you take a look at how this compares uh, to previous years, uh, you will see that in uh, 2020, uh, we're already at about halfway where we were uh, last calendar year. Um, so starting to be a uh, very positive uh, year. 
I do think we will have a strong finish in the fall. Um, and in as much as there's not a big second wave, uh, I think we might eclipse last year's five year high. Uh, same with jobs, that's corresponding along with uh, the spending. Uh, so the the COVID-19 impact, uh, we had two television pilot projects that were halted. Uh, there was, uh, both of those were in Wilmington, in the Wilmington area. There was a television series, uh, a new scripted uh, series that has uh, had their start delayed uh, that would have been in the Charlotte area. I don't have it mentioned here, but in the Piedmont Triad area, there was a um, at least one reality series, if you will. More, I, I like to think of it more as a documentary series um, that was to begin filming, uh, and that has been uh, pushed uh, now as well. And we've also had two feature-length films who uh, were ready to start, had started assembling crews, and those that that start has gotten pushed. Um, and then as, as several members ha have noted, there are, there are also some opportunities that are presenting itself here uh, as a result of the pandemic. And some of that is we have been talking with a number of projects that were scheduled to film in another jurisdiction, another location, and uh, that's not seeming realistic to these production companies. So um, those discussions have ranged everything from the project was possibly going to take place in a more densely populated area or a bigger city um, to they were going to shoot internationally and um, with some of the <clears throat> hotspot locations and possible quarantine uh, regulations, those uh, shows are now looking to stay within the US instead of going out of the country. So moving, uh, how are we looking moving forward? Um, there has only been one municipality that has informed the state film office when we've reached out and talked uh, that they would not issue a permit right now uh, if someone did ask for a film permit. Uh, that said, several of the uh, local municipalities have said um, they would contingently do one, but that the production would have to provide to their county health, health department, uh, kind of a COVID plan for safety uh, with that. The industry white paper that was discussed earlier um, has been presented to the governor's office and DHHS for sign off uh, and is being reviewed. Uh, those entities understand this is a uh, foundation, if you will, and that there will be additional requirements or uh, guidance from the individual trades, uh, trade unions, trade guilds, uh, and that it's very likely the individual productions will have uh, their own um, standards that will kind of go on top of this white paper. But uh, this has been presented and is being reviewed uh, for sign off um, with that. Uh, as I mentioned, those uh, guild association sign offs are really what is slowing down, if you will, the, those major production um, for productions from starting back up. And I know Dale mentioned late July, um, there's a lot of hope on possibly starting to get some boots on the ground July 1, uh, but that is a very fluid situation. And by boots on the ground, just meaning uh, starting uh, a little bit of pre-production, uh, starting to make some of those crew hires, uh, that sort of thing. But this is a very fluid situation and, um, you know, the, the longer it looks like there's nothing signed off on um, by the various associations, then that'll continue to get pushed back uh, for later starts. Um, and so I am crossing my fingers and saying, despite what everyone says on it being a possible active hurricane season, uh, that uh, it's not as active as being predicted and or uh, those storms stay out to sea um, because it does look like fall could be a very popular time. The other thing that we're doing uh, to be ready once productions are ready to resume is uh, those projects that we've been having serious conversations with. Uh, we've been providing a list of uh, North Carolina-based manufacturers that have been producing uh, 
uh, PPEs uh, during this time. And so that's been a key part, we think, in helping show that you can come to North Carolina and be ready uh, to film. And it's also getting those production companies in touch with those suppliers. So if they're going to need to order 500,000 um, masks that they can uh, start looking into that and working on that and having it be uh, from a local source, uh, if you will. So that has been uh, something that has been well received by the productions, again, that we're in those serious co communications with and showing that North Carolina will be ready. Um, I did want to address, again, going back on the guidelines, uh, there has been discussion on uh, with in myself and, and some others on should North Carolina have its own set of film guidelines um, that are about uh, safety, COVID-19 safety. I know that there have been some released by Georgia, um, and I believe even the state of Utah has done that. Uh, in my communications, um, it's kind of been those are nice, but that the guild and association uh, guidance that comes out is really what the projects are going to follow. And so since that has been the roadmap that these major productions are looking at, um, we've backed off on doing anything specific for North Carolina because didn't want to um, muddy the waters, if you will, or create extra hurdles for the productions to jump through uh, that, that, you know, may not be necessary uh, from that end. So uh, that is, uh, you know, where we've taken uh, a stance that we've taken um, and so are waiting on that sign off from the governor's office uh, and then certainly, uh, you know, know that the productions are also talking with local officials as well, and local health uh, departments on as they gear up on what their plans are and and how they intend to keep their crew and their talent safe as well as uh, the folks that they interact with while they're filming. Uh, so the very last part we do still technically have funds available uh, right now. Uh, we are continuing to move forward with uh, the assumption that 31 million in recurring funds will be added to the recruitment uh, pot, if you will. Our current pipeline, um, and these are projects in which uh, we feel that there's a um, greater than 60% chance that they will come into the state. Uh, we're looking at a potential 55 million in uh, requests. Um, and that would result, if all of that did come to fruition, it would mean more than $220 million being spent in the state. Uh, and all of that continues to be under the assumption of uh, wanting to set up before the end of this calendar year. Uh, part of that pipeline is the potential for those pilots that I mentioned to have series pickups. We've, we're also working very, very closely with four feature-length films, and there are four new series uh, that are looking at uh, the state. Um, and then there are additional uh, 40 projects that are in recruitment, of which 25 of these seem more or less likely that they could happen within the next uh, two years. And finally, I wanted to mention that um, there has been some efforts uh, by the state on working with a couple of uh, the production companies that have ex that continue to express concern about filming in North Carolina, particularly related to House Bill 2 and House Bill 142. Uh, those conversations have been very well received, um, and I do see North Carolina uh, once again, being considered, and particularly with one of the production companies, immediately uh, with the other. I think it's unfortunately will be December before we're really looked at, uh, but that the effort is being acknowledged to uh, right wrongs, if you will, and that uh, that, that company definitely sees themselves uh, coming to the state um, after December. So that uh, concludes the, the quick share there.
Are there any questions from the group? Uh, this is Robert. Oh, I didn't turn my camera on. I'm curious, Tim, <clears throat> are they uh, actually filming in Georgia now? Because they relaxed their restrictions before we did. Uh, no, not to my knowledge, they are not. We're getting, we're slowly, um, I was in the middle of a show at the time. Um, so we are very, very slowly inching our way forward in the event that we can go back to work. Guy, what are you hearing? I mean, just in the general filmmaking community, so many people expected to be working and suddenly we're out of work March through. Now, are they getting unemployment? Have they been able to do that? Uh, I'm actually going to, Darla, are you still with us? You might be able to address that more from what your membership, uh, you know, with that. Uh, you might be muted, Darla. Yes, members have been able to apply for unemployment and receive it. It's definitely been a, a task, but uh, we've been working with Representative Autry. He has used his office to help shepherd folks through the process who've never participated. And uh, I would tell you that people are pleasantly surprised uh, that, that we were able to get through this pan or get to the middle of this pandemic, hopefully towards the end. But we'll, yeah, they, they were fine. Sorry, say Eric or Lauren, uh, with any of the contractors you've maybe worked with, have you heard if they've also applied and, and qualified? I know that some of the unemployment rules were relaxed so that contractors were possibly ava uh, able to uh, qualify this time around. I'm not aware um, on the contractor side. Okay. You know, at the school, we're going to be starting up in August. Um, so we're actively um, you're working from uh, um, union white papers to create our own set of, of rules and requirements. And we'll have students living in dorms and working on sets. And so hopefully we can get it up and running. My question is, how long is the unemployment? Will that last? And will there be a lag between the time it runs out and the time production starts again? That's really my worry. Mm -hmm. That part I'm not familiar with, um, unfortunately, sorry. Uh, but can certainly look into it or see uh, with our friends with the Department of Commerce if there's uh, some additional information. I think we've certainly seen uh, state and federal efforts that as it as this has continued there have been um, moves to make it more accessible uh, and continue to make it available um, from that end so I, I wouldn't necessarily see that slowing down but also as states are starting to open up more and more um, you know I would not be surprised to see legislators uh, or legislatures, sorry, multiple states, you know, taking a look at, at the programs and how much do they continue doing if, if business is returning. Um, I don't think it's going to be back to usual, uh, but if business is returning from that. No, it, it'll be a sliding scale. So it, it, will it start to run out the minute one studio, you know, moves forward on one project? And then you'll see a, a great number of people still out of work. Um, I'm hearing things like two weeks, and they're going to start to see the unemployment checks run out. No, I, well, I just don't know how true that is. I heard the federal uh, $600 supplement was guaranteed through the end of July. Guy, for the projects that are considering coming to North Carolina that where we weren't in the game before, any significant feedback or insights uh, that you're hearing? Um, no, 
I, I, I'm assuming you mean the as a result of HB two the those um, no the the feedback has been very positive. Uh, the message that has been shared has been uh, some of the examples that this particular administration has done to um, to uh, both um, and it, this actually started before the current situation, but both to the LGBTQ plus community as well as uh, to other underrepresented groups. Uh, with that, that that was a message that was strongly encouraged to be shared uh, previously and has been. And so um, those those efforts seem to be uh, close to paying off, and you know not not giving us a a black ball anymore, if you will. So we're at least being considered and having those budgets run. And now it's, you know, finding the right project that, that works uh, for it. That's great. Thank you. Okay. Well, um, we're getting close to uh, noon. Um, that's probably a nice lead into uh, the next thing I wanted to mention, which is an executive order that the governor announced, um, I believe it was Thursday of last week, um, creating a task force that will work on healthcare disparities in communities of color, um, not just specific to COVID, but um, I believe just, just a study overall, but certainly the COVID crisis has shown a light on the the differences between treatment within the communities, diagnoses within the communities, and um, and ultimate uh, mortality rates. So, um, Catherine, I don't did we share that information with the group? We did. Yes, okay. it was distributed with the most recent agenda, and it is in the Google um, folder. Okay. The chat folder. Um. Does anybody have any questions about that? Okay. Um, just on that subject, he is also going to um, have a conference call, that, or excuse me, a press conference this afternoon at three o'clock. So if you're not tied up, I would encourage you to watch it. I suspect it has, uh, will have a lot to do with um, the recent violence we've seen uh, throughout the country and some measures that he intends to take. Um, and probably an additional executive order. So I encourage you to watch that at three o'clock. Um, I also want to reiterate um, what Dr. Tiemann said. Amy, thank you so much for mentioning COVID and being careful and watching those numbers. Unfortunately, we have seen um, an increase. I think uh, we saw our largest day yet uh, yesterday, uh, or if it wasn't today, as a matter of fact. And now we're in a list of states that um, has have actually seen our cases spike to new heights uh, and new hospitalization rates um, over the last two weeks. So uh, we've got that um, impacting us as well. So um, please heed her advice and the advice of the governor, follow those uh, CDC guidelines and please be careful and take care of yourselves, take care of your families. There is nothing, there's nothing more important. So, um, Finally, I would also agree with Guy um, that over the last two weeks, it's been an eventful two weeks, uh, we're not exaggerating, but there have been some high level conversations um, between um, production houses and uh, our leadership uh, from top to the bottom and bottom to the top. And that is a really good sign. We are hearing very positive reactions um, and remarks about uh, North Carolina's positioning right now, and frankly, how how the governor and the administration has handled the crisis, um, in addition to the work that the administration has done for diversity and inclusion, uh, from the makeup of his cabinet right down to um, uh, our uh, creation of of divisions that work on diversity and inclusion specifically throughout state government. So. Um, we look forward to our next time together. Uh, probably won't be in person, but we'll hope for that day someday soon. And if there are no more questions um, and no more housekeeping, I will say thank you again. And we'll look forward to talking with you soon.
Thanks, Susie. Thanks, Great, thanks. Good to see everyone. Take care, everybody. Thank you.